John, you built the first CSL DMP modem 20 years ago. Did you expect 400 million homes to be connected in 2014? Uh, I did eventually expect it to get widely used. We knew there were a billion phone lines around the world. The hope was certainly that, that we could be used on, on many of them, but it's still very rewarding to, to see. I, I think the correct number is, you know, the data is 500 million, but yeah, it, it's gratifying to, to see the technology used so widely. Oh, how fast was that? The, well, the original modems ran up to six or eight megabits per second. Um, it would um, run at a faster speed on a shorter line or so, but two miles of phone line, it would run about six megabits per second. And today, how fast is DSL? Well, there are various forms of DSL that have been standardized by the um, various organizations around the world, particularly the ITU and the um, uh, the speeds easily get into tens of megabits on existing DSLs today to some at 100 megabits per second, so-called vector uh, VDSLs that are just beginning to be uh, deployed. And there's even a new standard called V.fast that allows you to go up to a gigabit per second um, if the uh, length of the copper twister pair is sufficiently short so that it would support that. And I'm getting John's Live, live, John. In a moment, I should be able to click you, bring your video live, and get the slides on the screen. Okay. Of uh, some people. And here is John's desktop. John, will you please bring your slides up? I am doing that All right now, and I'll put it in full screen mode. So. People can see that. Ho hopefully, and I, I can see Dave Clark in my video plus the screen. I, I don't know if others can, can see that or not. And I believe people are seeing and should be seeing uh, the slides. But let me introduce Dave Clark. Dave, some of your latest work has been examining the actual congestion on the internet. What do you find, Dave? Well, what we're finding is that, by and large, the core of the internet is not congested. I don't think we have a widespread congestion problem. We can talk about this a little bit more later if you want, but what we find is that the places where we see congestion are correlated with, I think, widely recognized business issues that are going on today having to do with engineering and, and payment to deliver high volume content, Netflix and Google. But if you look at, for example, a network like Comcast, which has, you know, 50 plus clearing partners, and many links to some of those, you find two or three places where there's congestion. So I think the center of the network is healthy. Uh, that's a US centric comment, of course. If you look at links across the ocean and look at links in other parts of the world, they may be different. But I think the core of the internet today is, is healthy. Doesn't mean you always have a perfect experience, but we can come back to that. Dave, so have we been able to keep up with all the traffic on the internet? Has the core kept up? Well, I think it has. You know, when when you look at, for example, you look at the inside of Comcast, and we looked at Time Warner, we looked at Comcast, we looked at Cox, we looked at Verizon, we looked at a bunch of networks, and some overseas too, British Telecom, uh, Free. You don't see congestion in the core of their internal network. Where you see the congestion is at the interconnection points. And I think congestion there really is a signal of a of an ongoing business arrangement that hasn't been fully resolved. But we don't find congestion inside these networks. Okay. Folks so like I think and is clearly growing. Go ahead. Folks have been show, like Aquaman have been shown growth that's handling the speed just fine. But their projections that growth is going to continue and the web is going to have a lot more traffic in the future. Are you optimistic about continuing to keep up? I am. I am optimistic. I think there will always be point problems, but I actually think that the, the addition of capacity to the core of the net is not where we have a problem. The technology is straightforward. It's a cost issue. The question is, do the ISPs have an incentive to invest? And that's what I think the place. Dave, I apologize. You had a hesitation there, and I thought you were 
taking a It's picture. possible that we have some latency in the system here with the standard side effect of Psi using the Internet. All I was going to say is I, we have to be sure that the ISPs have a proper incentive to invest in the fact that Akamai predicts all this growth or Sandheim predicts all this growth doesn't mean that everybody will make the necessary investment. But I think the technology is in place. The conversation we're having with John today is, I think, technically the more interesting one because it's the it's the equipment that gets you to the consumer, to the residents, to the home, where we see more diversity in technology, we see more diversity in, in economics, and we certainly see more diversity around, around the globe. And with that, let's go over to John Crawford. John is a Stanford professor, the chairman of OSIA that does the matters and much more. He's going to mention cloud check along the way from Zoom's Rada. And one of the most distinguished engineers I've ever had the pleasure of working with. John, how do we get VSL and homes to the billion gigabits without oh, and, running Fiverr? Well, yeah, that, that's that been the goal for uh, for a long time, and it is feasible technically to do that. Uh, and of course, the advantage of doing it with existing media or a, a uh, it is of course the cost uh, that it would take and the time that it would take to do that. So broadly painted here, gigabit per second to a billion customers is possible uh, in a reasonable period of time. Uh, using largely what we have today, uh, I, I lead Dave as the, the expert on the core network. Uh, typically when I give a talk to a large group, uh, something I'll ask people to raise their hands, I can't do that here, but almost everybody in the audience raises their hands. Some people put two hands up. If I ask them if they've had problems um, using their smartphone, their tablet, their internet service, and viewing video or other things, and everyone's hand goes up. So there are um, issues to, to be resolved, and a lot of that has to do with the access link equipment, uh, as Dave uh, mentioned. So what are some of the broad themes that we can use uh, to get there, and how far away is it? So looking at my second slide, <clears throat> maybe the most important thing to start with uh, is this, this concept of uh, an unhappy consumer who is trying to use the Internet, and for whatever reason, something is not working like they uh, they'd like it to do to, to, to work, and what they really want um, is is that content they're using, maybe an over-the-top application, or maybe something supplied by an ISP. Um, uh, they'd like like it to work well. If they have a problem, they'd like it to be fixed uh, quickly, uh, almost without knowing it, without having to go to a lot of difficulty or pay a large amount of money to have that that fixed, um, and. You know, the, the big question that, that, that is often out there, there's a perception in the world that you, you have to run a fiber uh, to everyone's home in order to resolve these problems. And, of course, that's a very expensive endeavor. It can get into trillions of dollars realistically if you look at it on a global uh, uh, basis. Um, it's been promised for a long time, uh, basically most of my career is 35 years in spanning. Uh, so you look at it and you say, okay, what do we have available? What can be done uh, more more quickly? And that's really the objective of getting billions of bits to billions of users. Um, so putting up uh, gigabit per second process here now, the first bullet here on slide three you see coming up, uh, there are 100 megabit uh, services. Typically these are half a kilometer to kilometer length of, uh, of twisted pair fiber. Uh, getting close to the customers, say, within that last mile, that last kilometer, uh, but not all the way, and that can be cost-effective, and you see announcements um, over the last couple of years, uh, Deutsche Telekom, AT&T, and others all committing um, uh, to putting fiber close enough that they can get to 100 megabit per second services, and some of that's starting to happen uh, today is so-called vectored uh, VDSLs. Um, and then you can look at the overlapping Wi-Fi. Of course, we all know that the, the consumers using the Internet uh, today are increasingly using smartphones or tablets along with their PCs, uh, maybe their, their digital TVs, IPTV. And more often than not, they're using a Wi-Fi connection. And the number of, of Wi-Fis that overlap in urban areas can get up to as many as 24. In suburban areas can be six. And, and you look at it and you say, okay, well, these, these Wi-Fi's actually uh, based on a collision 
uh, protocol that if two users are using the same panel at the same time, uh, they collide, they both have to back off and try again at some random period in time later. This produces the performance of these systems. So ideally, you'd like to get them on, on, on different channels. And there are 23 channels for, for Wi-Fi. It's somewhat random which ones get used in certain, um, certain areas. So uh, to some degree, it can be a problem. But as I, as I try to point out here in this discussion, is it can also be an opportunity. Um, with all of these overlapping channels, each of those can be capable of roughly 100 uh, megabits per second. Uh, and because they're overlapping, they're within the range of the devices, it's possible to bond them together and to basically magnify the bandwidth by the sum total of all of the bonded connections. So if you had 20 connections on overlapping, uh, non-overlapping channels and they're all supporting 100 megabits per second, that's a two gigabit per second stream uh, back uh, to the, the internet. And all of that uh, here that we're talking about is without having to have a fiber um, uh, very close to the, uh, to the customer, of course, that would be more cost effective. Moving on, of course, the, uh, the big question, slide four, is how much fiber, uh, if it's copper, what I've shown quick compare here, could be coax, a similar type of question, um, and of course, the, uh, the wireless uh, connectivity within the home. How much fiber, uh, more fiber, more cost. The reason fiber gets so expensive is it moves out closer to the customer, realistically thousands of dollars per customer on average, is because the cost of installing that fiber, digging trenches, doing whatever is necessary, um, gets divided by a smaller number of users who are able to benefit. So the price goes up rapidly as you move closer uh, to the consumer. Of course, the copper is already there. On the shared part of the fiber, uh, as Dave said, uh, the network's capable of handling, uh, uh, you know, IP networks uh, 10 gigabits per second going to hundreds of gigabits per second on, on the fiber uh, connection uh, where that's needed uh, in, in the core. That may not be needed um, all the way to the home. And then the wireless connection inside the home. Moving on to the next slide, just more uh, the uh, the German program is, is announced publicly. Uh, 24 million lines be upgraded 100 megabit roughly uh, speed DSLs, um, some fiber out to within a half a kilometer. So the estimated cost of this was about 300 euros per home. Um, and when they did the study, they also reported publicly the reason they weren't running a fiber to every home was the cost of that was between 3,000 and 4,000 euros uh, per home uh, to do that, 100 megabits being of interest. Um, by, by contrast, um, uh, France um, uh, had promised uh, that they'd have most of the country uh, covered in fiber, uh, but the, um, the expenses of that slowed it down. And just recently, last year, the entire government in Australia changed uh, specifically on the issue of fiber versus copper uh, in the access plan. And the reason was the fiber subscription cost the public would have to pay for it uh, under the old government, which was deposed basically on this is going to be over $200 a month, uh, and it was going to be mandated. Everyone will have to, have to do that. So um, you see the, uh, that part of the, the equation or the technology that's necessary starting to come into place, the 100 megabit per second uh, DSLs. We also see Wi-Fi. If you've been reading the press, uh, some of the latest standards on Wi-Fi using MIMO technologies get over a gigabit per second in terms of speed using multiple uh, antennas. Now, one of the things that's happening, that's between a, essentially a single access point and maybe one or two or in, in some cases four uh, clients uh, that use these new types of Wi-Fi. And what they do is they take the channels, those 20 megahertz wide channels, and they bond them together, uh, up to eight of them in some cases. So you'd have instead of 20, 160 megahertz uh, per second. But you are using um, much of the uh, Wi-Fi spectrum that's available when you do that. So, of course, somebody else uh, could not necessarily use that, and you would expect more collisions as it uh, starts to happen. But nonetheless, the hardware is there to support these, these, um, these multiple channels in, in parallel, if you will. And what needs to be done is simply to take that same hardware, change the firmware a bit, and essentially break it down into multiple independent Wi-Fi which then can talk to different access points uh, in parallel. And that way you get to add uh, the data rates together. 
So this, this does pose some management issues. Um, there are things that can be done. My, my own company, Asia, which is down in the corner, does uh, tend to do it. If you'd like to see more on that, you can download the uh, Cloud Check uh, application that's listed there from either the Apple Store or Google Play. It takes some measurements and it can explain uh, things to you uh, uh, about how, your, how well your connection is working. But there are examples of multiple SSIDs being used for Wi-Fi today. Uh, this basically exploits that further. Uh, one of the lead companies that's often mentioned is the so-called FOM. Moving on, slide seven just il illustrates the concept. You have one connection with a Wi-Fi gateway to the consumer. Uh, DSL shown behind it here runs at one rate, R1. A second, maybe in an adjacent apartment, a Wi-Fi connected on a different phone line, but to that same consumer device has rate two. Uh, possibly the third connection could be LTE, could be a femtocell base station, another base station somewhere nearby, also received by the consumer. And it's possible through what's called uh, IP layer uh, bonding, to basically through a single IP address, map all of those, um, those data streams together so that you get the sum total of the data rates. So this is how you can get hundreds of megabits per second up to gigabits per second. Uh, so the, uh, the, uh, and all of that, of course, is done with the existing connections with maybe fiber more in the core of the network, but not necessarily migrating where it's most expensive out to the ends of the network. If you look at slide eight, this is just a breakdown here uh, of the fixed access um, uh, connection uh, technology. That I can you hear me? Yes, I can. I want to interrupt you there. Because Go ahead. This is a punchline and you weren't being very dramatic. Are you saying that between Wi-Fi and DSL, it's going to be practical to get hundreds of megabits and even sometimes a gigabit? Yes, it's certainly practical uh, just on DSL alone if the, if the line is short enough. But using Wi-Fi, you don't have to have that real short line, and that makes it even more cost-effective to get to those high speeds. Uh, and I'd like to let the audience know, I think we've got about 75 people on, that you're probably the first audience to be hearing this idea. Uh, John is taking the latest Wi-Fi, the latest DSL, some things that are shipping soon but are still in the labs, and saying what we can see in a year, two years, three years. John, is that a fair description? That is. And let me hand it back to you. We're going to take questions in five minutes. Just put them in the chat window. Of or send them to me. And John, back to you. Okay, so slide eight, just pointing out that there are a lot of copper connections out there already uh, that could be exploited, uh, particularly the DSL line, almost 500 million now, as we said uh, uh, earlier. So all of those pre present an opportunity to um, use in this type of architecture, uh, whatever speed they're running, uh, but to amplify through essentially multiple SSIDs and Wi-Fi's and sharing. Uh, Wi-Fi issues are shown on slide nine. I'll be quick here if you see that. But basically, these Wi-Fi's do overlap, and that's either an opportunity in terms of crosstalk between them. Um, uh, you get into the management um, and the use of the different channels, but there are ways to do that. Um, increase uh, the more groups that are participating, obviously, the, uh, the better it can be. But even if only one or two are participating, there's still a significant improvement that you can often make by exploiting the fact that the Wi-Fi's actually overlap uh, in terms of their spatial coverage. And moving on to slide 10, this is just some examples. This is from about 10,000 customers. Dave mentioned some early um, efforts in this area of speeds and be before and after you start trying to work uh, with these, these systems in terms of what is the, the consumer actually getting? And these are lower speeds. They're not showing gigabits per second here. These are using existing systems where the DSLs behind them may be supporting 10 megabits per second uh, type speeds or lower, and the Wi-Fi's themselves uh, are supporting even lower speeds, as you see here in some cases, below three megabits, three to five megabits, and so forth. But using techniques like this, uh, you can improve that distribution speeds uh, to, uh, uh, to the, obviously, to the consumer benefit. Just some examples on slide 11. Um, let's suppose you have uh, an LTE connection running 50 megabits per second and a Wi-Fi VDSL connection running 
54 megabits per second. Well, if you can bond those two together, uh, that's feasible almost today uh, to do that. Some of the smartphones will support this type of thing already, as long as you have a server supporting it um, in the cloud, uh, and you're at 100 megabits per second. A little bit more uh, sophisticated example, suppose you actually had three connections, Wi-Fi and DSL, all within vicinity of one another, running at 108 megabits per second each, or up to 300 uh, megabits per second uh, there. Uh, if you were to use the latest DSL uh, standards in the future that, that run at very uh, high speeds, uh, several hundred megabits per gigabit per second, and you use the latest uh, 802.11 that should read uh, in Wi-Fi, some of those will run 600 megabits per second uh, each. Uh, three of those sharing can get you to 1.8 gigabits per second um, on the uh, without having to get fiber all the way to everyone's device. Uh, and it just by example, if we looked at the kind of fiberhood concept, which is a separate fiber to everyone's home, uh, there uh, you could get one gigabit per second, um, and you could possibly get the latest uh, Wi-Fi equipment. Um, 802.11 AD will support greater than one gigabit per second, um, and then you, you're just uh, doing that for each uh, individual customer, but of course that's the most expensive option in terms of the uh, fiber. And my conjecture here on slide 11, most consumers today would probably be pretty happy just on, on option A above where they're getting uh, 100 megabits per second um, that they can use for their connection. And so, I, Dave, I'm going to cut out here. They can, the, the last few slides, if people are interested in more information, some of the just timelines, slide 12 that I have up showing quickly, and slide 13 just makes a basic point about how much uh, service providers will pay uh, to acquire a customer. Today it's based on the profitability um, over a three month, uh, sorry, a three year uh, return on investment model. But typically that's a thousand dollars a customer or less is what it's worth uh, to attract a new customer and to keep an existing customer, uh, it may be a few hundred uh, uh, dollars uh, each. So all of these things I'm talking about are well within these budgets. Um, is really the point of the, uh, the, uh, the talk. So, and then I, I end just by showing I do have a pond. I, I'm fortunate I have a home in Paris as well as in California, and uh, these are actual speed tests taken on my pond system between 7 and 10 p.m. at night when everyone in my building and all their kids and so forth are using the Internet. Uh, speed's not very good. It's just a couple of megabits per second, and I actually wanted to watch a video at that point, uh, coming over the top from the United States, I uh, wasn't able to do it with good quantity, quality, um, and they had taken away my old DSL, which ran six megabits per second, that was unshared, so I actually had better video quality early. The next morning, um, uh, PON uh, uh, was running back at 90 megabits per second. I wish I could have had that earlier, uh, but it does illustrate that uh, just running a fiber doesn't necessarily uh, solve uh, the problem you have the wireless connectivity to the devices, and then of course you have the sharing on the medium um, itself. So uh, with that, Dave, I think I'm going to turn control over back uh, uh, to you, uh, uh, as you, I know you'd like to take some questions. Uh, we'll bring Dave Clark on the screen in a minute. Meanwhile, let me ask you on voice. Dave, what do you think of what John's presenting? I think this is a very clever piece of technology. I, I was going to make three comments. And I think the first one is that I think over the next few years we will actually see a shift in how the consumer thinks about their capacity to the house. And we'll see a shift away from peak speed to the question of sustainable throughput and how many hours of video you can watch a month. You know, John's comment about not being able to watch that video, the important thing to understand if you think about a, a Netflix high-definition video today, it's about five megabits a second. So these dreams of gigabits are one way for people to kick each other and drive them into a competitive frenzy. But in fact, the typical consumer today is not buying 100 megabits, even if it's available, because what they've sorted out is that if they have various devices in their house, they can still get away with 50. I think the second point is that 
the John's comment about fiber to the home not being the answer is critical. We have to look today at where the source of impairment is to the consumer experience. And I absolutely agree with him that the frowny face on the slide is the critical issue which any competitive ISP is going to have to deal with. And you know, ISPs that find themselves in a competitive position today, I would assume that Free and Frost Telecom and so forth would find themselves in a competitive position, would be very interested in figuring out where this bottleneck is. But competition should be bringing out these issues, and I think if we shift the competition away from my network could, in principle, go faster than your network, we would actually do more to make the consumer happy. And I, and I think the third point is John's leveraging a very obvious sort of piece of sunk cost, which is lots and lots of people have copper. But clearly, there are going to be lots of trajectories that people use to try to solve all these issues. The cable industry has a separate set of issues. They're talking about shared gigabit on a channel, so you know, this doesn't really solve their problem. They, DOCSIS 3.1 is what they're going to do. And as he points out, fiber to the home, you don't need to think about this kind of bonding so long as your target is a gigabit with the fiber can do it. So this has a place in the ecosystem. I think it's a very exciting place. But the final point I would make, you know, he sort of said is, is the, are these overlapping Wi-Fi's either an opportunity or a, or a problem? Certainly some of the research that my friends have been doing have pointed out that in a lot of cases, the reason that this consumer is having an impaired experience is the Wi-Fi. And one of the things that happens in the evening in a, in a dense dwelling unit is everybody starts using the Wi-Fi and you're getting all kinds of congestion, interference. So John's scheme depends on doing a lot of sort of engineering or grooming or optimizing the Wi-Fi. And I think that's got some operational challenges, not so technology challenges that are going to have to be worked through to make this work. And of course, if you could do that, you would improve everybody's Wi-Fi experience in general and eliminate a lot of the problems today where the ISPs get a phone call in their service desk, but what's really broken is the Wi-Fi at home. So I think this is really clever, but I think contextually there are a lot of issues wrapped around it. And what we really should be focusing on is what are we going to do to improve the consumer experience? Because that really is the metric, and if ISPs are competitive, that's what they're going to be held up to. We need to learn how to measure that. It, that, that's, that's a very good summary, Dave. I, I agree with you. The consumer experience is really the important thing. And, and even this little measuring device, I mentioned the cloud tech that, um, that is out there, it's free. People can download and use it. There's a little thumbs up and thumbs down on it that basically allows the, the consumer to say, this is good or it's not good, uh, which is ultimately the best indicator. Uh, of all is is are they getting what they want when they want it with, without without problems and and I, I do agree with you very much so that it probably doesn't take a gigabit uh, per second to do that uh, and the operational issues that you described uh, are important but fortunately with increasingly you know software defined everything um, I believe some of these issues can be addressed and uh, as you say there's there's a part of the market where or I believe it's going to be possible to uh, to improve significantly, uh, even if we could, we don't deliver the gigabit per second uh, uh, to 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 everyone uh, using uh, cleverness and capabilities that just now are entering the marketplace in terms of the increasingly more software defined um, access networks, uh, telecom network, core network uh, capabilities that. Um, uh, are just just entering the marketplace along with some of these high speed uh, um, access technologies as well. John, John, Dave asked about whether you can deal with the interference problems. The Wi-Fi folks are working hard on that. Are they making good progress? So there's there's multiple solutions to that, and yes, MIMO is one of those. The uh, multiple antennas allows a, a kind of a very narrow streaming of the energy from your um, transmitter to your receiver and the hope is to try to avoid others who don't want your your signal in, in doing that. Um, there are limitations of course and all of these technologies depends on the environment, the number of antennas. Um, but the, um, the the key thing I think of in a little simpler level but at a broader level is if you have uh, systems and you're recording consumer content and you're looking at the channels that they're using and so forth and managing that on a statistical basis, you can see enormous improvements. Uh, just doing that without uh, necessarily getting down to the 
a fine layer of using multiple antennas and improving things uh, just to avoid the collision between the systems because as Dave said, and we have data indicating this too, quite often it is the Wi-Fi uh, that's limiting the quality uh, uh, of, the, uh, of the connection. And there's some simple things that can be done in cloud-based management. There's other things that can be done in the physical devices with multiple antennas. All of those things tend to reduce uh, the interference between the Wi-Fi. And what I'm suggesting here is actually an opportunity to be exploited uh, and to increase the overall data rate of, uh, that each consumer uh, can possibly receive. Ernie Aronson had a question. He said, is this just for urban areas? Or is it also important, can we do something in rural areas where people aren't so close together and not necessarily in Wi-Fi rec? Well, the, the, you, can, obviously you, can't share, you cannot share Wi-Fi if you're in a rural area there's only one that you're, you're receiving. I think the rural area solutions, the, the good news is that the spectrum is less used in a, in a general sense uh, in those regions because the population is less. So that spectrum that's available because it's not shared, uh, wireless may be a bigger component of the solution in those areas than trying to, uh, to run a fiber close uh, if there's only one or two customers uh, that are going to be supported by that fiber. Okay. Somebody asked a question that we already have on some Android phones, the ability to combine LTE and the local Wi-Fi but it doesn't work on his phone and most carriers haven't turned it on. John, what do you see happening there? Uh, that's correct. There are, it's certainly feasible technically. Uh, certain types of, of uh, smartphones today already allow through kind of an open management interface the bonding uh, of the, uh, the Wi-Fi and the LTE. There are other uh, types of smartphones where the uh, uh, you have to have access to what's called the private application programmer interfaces to be able to, uh, to bond them together. So that's a function really of the, uh, the manufacturer and whether they're allowing access uh, to the IP layer bonding capability or not. And, and as I said, without mentioning specific company names here, there are some that are supporting that and some that are, are not uh, allowing that private access just yet. Uh, I've got a question from Professor Martin Zerbo. Will we see this kind of Wi-Fi channel bonding first in corporate networks or residential settings? He also asks, some of the carriers, like Free in France, are already sharing the Wi-Fi with other subscribers of the FON model. Do you see that happening more, and how does this work in an FON model? Yeah, well, well, this is John speaking. The, the FON model, I, I think, is a good one. I think they've had a lot of success um, as a company with multiple SSIDs. It's a first step uh, in that model. Of course, you're, you're only accessing one Wi-Fi access point at a time. Uh, you're just uh, empowered uh, to, uh, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to be able to, the access points themselves will support multiple SSIDs to different customers, but there is no IP layer bonding yet in that solution, but it's a very good, uh, it's a good first step, and it certainly shows uh, that multiple SSID is, uh, is a concept that's feasible to you. I'd like to take a minute and recognize Joseph Kutundi. He's a young scholar of the Marconi Foundation who sponsors this. Hopefully one day he'll do the kind of work that will make him a Marconi Fellow. The Marconi Foundation has as fellows many of the leading communication engineers in the world. Dave's work was on less in communication and more network, so I don't think he's grown a Marconi yet. Let me hand it over to Dave here. Dave is, Dave is at MIT, thoroughly distinguished engineer. And lately, he's been looking at the backbone and core of the internet. So let me start it off by asking Dave, are we keeping up? Will we, will we be able to continue keeping up? I think we are keeping up, although the answer will vary depending where you are. Hang on a sec. Am I muted or not? Are you hearing me? 
I'm hearing you just okay. I muted earlier. I wanted to make sure I muted this this technology stuff is, is really terrible. Um I think you know, you're gonna see regional variations, you're gonna see global variations. If somebody asked about rural areas, they have an entirely different challenge. Uh I think the developing world is a very different challenge. But the part of the world we're talking about here, US, France, places like that. I think that we are going to keep up. I think the issue of investing in the core is actually not the major problem that the carriers face. I think driving some of these operational issues out that add cost is a major issue. This comment about can we just sort of clean up the Wi-Fi space generally, reduce the number of calls to the help desk, reduce truck rolls. Um, if we can get more of that automated, we'll have a tremendous advantage in reducing cost and improving consumer uh, consumer satisfaction. I think yeah, I don't I don't remember who it was that asked about the rural area, but the rural area has a whole bunch of different challenges. My my friends who talk about wireless, especially in the not in the context of wi Wi-Fi in the house, but trying to do fixed wireless, is they call it EE hard. They mean electrical engineering hard. You put the things up, and then you have you have sort of problems at the physical level. You put the antenna on the side of the house, and it's not getting a signal for some reason. Oh, it's please, it's please. You put the stuff up in the middle, and the please leave out, and the phone will stop working. And one of the arguments in favor of fiber, fiber, which will have its place, is you spend capital up front, and then it usually keeps working unless somebody runs up, plows through it. So we're going to have this tremendous diversity in response, but I'm not I'm not worried overall about the core of the internet. As I said, what we see today is by and large a, a rich mesh of peering connections at all levels. They're properly provisioned. And my sense is when the capacity gets uh, near saturation, they're putting in more because it's actually more in their mutual interest. So I don't think that's where the cost issue is and I don't think that's where the barriers to the future are. I think I think the barriers are the things we've been hitting at around the edges here, the developing world, perhaps transcontinental links, which I see as being heavily congested some of the time because they're just expensive. The, con the, the outside plant getting to the consumer, the home, and so forth. And I think there's some tremendous coordination problems. You know, this question about whether we could turn on LCD and Wi-Fi at the same time, it doesn't do you any good unless, as John said, you have Cost the content trying to come to you to come to a further come on the cloud that can split it out across those two paths. And, and to get that kind of complexity integrated in so that it's not something that geeks can do, but the system does it for you automatically, there's a lot of sort of architecture development that you're going to have to do to make some of these things work. And notice those architecture developments are necessarily bonding all of these that may be competitive. You know, the, the, the wireline guy with Wi-Fi is in the LTE guy, not necessarily um, aligned in their interests here. Dave, are you handing off? I lost you there. Oh yes, that did, did I fade out? That was a that was a that was a over and over. <laughs> this shit, this stuff stuff so bad. Ah, okay. We've got two distinguished guests, John Choppy of Stanford and Dave Clark at MIT. Those, of course, are always rivals, East and West Coast, but I think they're agreeing on a lot of this. There's room for a few more questions. One of the things that's been coming are whether the slides are going to be available, whether it's a replay, and whether there's a transcript, and the answer to all that is yes. We're ready to take another question or two if we have it. Meanwhile, John, why don't you give us a comment about what Dave's been saying? Well, I, I, Dave is correct. I, I think, you know, uh, the, what I, I have to point out is that, it, that he, he's not too worried about the core, and Dave is, of course, an expert uh, on that. He's been measuring that and working in the field for, so he feels very confident on the part he knows, and that, that would be the part that I don't know about uh, as well, and, and I'm glad he's confident on it. On the access point, uh, he's correct about the operational issues and so forth, uh, but it is an area that's gotten a lot of um, 
a lot of looks, a lot of study the last well, five, six years. So since I know more about that area, well, he's correct in identifying the operational issues. I believe there are solutions emerging. I'm confident that those can be solved because I know more about that area. So I'm each each is feeling comfortable in his own area of expertise, um, uh, and uh, we tend, might tend to be normally worried more about the other uh, area of expertise. So um, uh, he, it, it's correct, uh, but I do think solutions are emerging uh, for some of those operational issues. We need to add one person to the panel who is a specialist in consumer-facing human factors and assessing the frustration level getting all this stuff to work in the home. And then we would have had a complete spectrum of That's right. coverage where we might have conceivably found a help. Yeah, I agree, I agree. <laughs> you know, there's one other dimension to this, Dave, and I don't know if you can, you can, if you have a question, that's fine, but there's one other dimension to this. I think it's important for everybody to understand the distinction between the broadband access to the house, which is uh, a platform on which a number of things can be done, and the Internet. And if you look at the cable industry, it's going to move over the next few years to DOCSIS 3.1, and they're doing on their cable some of the things, same things John was talking about. They're bonding more spectrum. They're going to move much more of the spectrum to an IT-based packet technology. It doesn't mean that all of that's going to be used to deliver the Internet to the home. It's going to be used to deliver a range of services. There may be carrier-based video. You're getting carrier-based telephony today. And so as we have all of these are to understand that what the carriers want to do is sell you a range of services, not all of which are the Internet. And the way we manage capacity and manage the system should be thought of in the context of that kind of business anticipation. The totality of the product that they sell you is not the internet. Over. Hi. Got a question here from Charles Hall, who's on Ryan Reporter, is a very strong newsletter. Did the telcos have enough time to develop and deploy these technologies before the cable TV companies get to a gigabit with Doxis 3.1? Dave, you've been talking to a lot of cable guys when you do. Was that a question to me? I couldn't hear. Dave, can you, can you hear me now? Yeah. Um, okay. I think you, I think you would turn down low on the, on your speaker, or you're not as close to the speaker. So come up when you answer this. Charles Hall asked, "Can the telcos come up with this stuff before the cable come cable codes come in with Doxis three one, and themselves get to gigabits?" Again, I think the question varies on the face of the earth. In the United States, Dave, you've got to come closer to the mic. One, two, three, four, five. Something failed here? Go ahead. The telephone companies face a widely deployed cable infrastructure as a serious competition. That's not equally true in many of the countries where you find an installed uh, copper base. So. I think the telephone companies in different countries face a very different landscape. I think it's clear that AT&T has decided to enter into another cycle of, of commitment to upgrades. They are doing exactly what John illustrated, not with respect to the bonding of Wi-Fi, but pushing the fiber closer, shortening the fibers, doing this vectored stuff to get more capacity. And I think they're doing that very aggressively. I think the cable guys are clear that DOCSIS 3.1 will let them get to a gigabit, and that's not what the customer wants. The customer isn't buying 100 megabits today, even if you offer it to them. What the customer wants to buy is a stable service, and it's fast enough to deliver a couple of movies. So I think the challenge for both of these operators is, in fact, to think about how to give the customer what satisfies the customer. And my point is that's not about peak speed. And I. I'm a little concerned that we've sort of entered into this um, peak speed horse race, you know, the OECD and the ITU rate countries on, on what the headline speed is. But that, I'm not convinced that's what's actually determining whether the consumer is satisfied. As John said, you know, he can have a high speed speed into his house and when he does a test on it, it might be longer two megabits. That's the issue to solve. 
and I think the telephone companies and the cable companies are in an equal position with very different technologies to move to address that issue. Dave was just talking about consumers. John, you would ask that you have been working on consumer products. Why don't you tell us what's coming there? Yeah, that's the focus of this whole cloud check, uh, the free app and measuring. It actually separately measures your, your fixed line speed, whatever it is, DSL cable or, or, or fiber. It measures your Wi-Fi uh, speed. It also measures speed um, to a, a server on uh, the Internet that you, you can select the server uh, for that to get an idea of where uh, the bottleneck that might be making the consumer unhappy, uh, if it's a Wi-Fi, uh, good there, if it's somewhere else, uh, you would know. But that is uh, the important thing, and we all get caught up in the gigabits and the high speeds, but Dave is, is correct. It's really that stable service and keeping the consumer happy, even if it's, you know, you, your neighbor, the apartment below and above, you're all getting only only five megabits per second each, and if you were to bond them together, now you have 15, and hopefully you're not all using it at the same time, um, you, you can use these types of concepts even there. Uh, to improve, but the end game, and Dave is correct, I agree, should be that consumer and uh, the uh, the reason for putting a little thumbs up and thumbs down or like or don't like uh, type indication is really just that simple information. Um, is the is the consumer happy and what is being done? That is what competition should be all about between the uh, cable companies, the telcos, the wireless service providers uh, to make sure uh, that they really are getting what they want to get um, without without problems, because I think that is the issue rather than than raw speed. And and there are a lot of people, as I said, when I when I asked that question at the beginning of the talk, it's a room filled with hundreds of people. Everybody goes; they're almost cheering that someone asked that question. So uh, that that unhappiness is not there, and with a bit of a saturation in wireless and wireline markets, um, the churn. Of customers from one uh, provider to another, I think, is going to be the important trend uh, in the future uh, of telecom. And to the extent there's more competition to try to keep that customer happy, as Dave said, um, that's that's the real value in the the cable people trying to get ahead of the the telcos and the telcos trying to fight back. Uh, um, as long as they're close to one another, and they have been for decades, I expect they they will continue to be. Um, that helps uh, drive, and the more competition you have, the uh, typically the better the, the service that's provided. Folks, our last Marconi webinar had John's colleague at Stanford, Andrea Goldsmith, project that wireless is going to get 50 times faster in the next few years. We have scheduled a fiber expert. Sir David Payne, who's also chair of the Marconi Society, which brought you this webinar. Thank you all. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, John. I'm going to give out my email. Anybody who wants to send a, an email to John or Dave, send it to me and I'll forward it. I'm Dave B at DSLprime.com. That's Dave B at DSLprime.com. I'm going to send an email out with the slides tomorrow. Thank you, everybody, and good night. Thank you, Dave. And thank you.